day my friends welcome back to the TMV production offices aka my bedroom well I got something for you today that I've been sitting on for a long time years now this the idea for this video dates back to the original channel um, I'm gonna be talking about duel not a review because we've been there and done that but there are still some things about that movie that I would like to go over with you so grab your poison of choice and let's begin Cheers. As I mentioned uh, when I did my review of the movie, uh, it's based on a story by Richard Matheson, which is contained in this book here. It is, in fact, the title story, Duel by Richard Matheson. It also contains uh, quite a bunch of his uh, other short stories that uh, make for great bathroom reading. The guy's uh, quite a good, he was quite a good writer. Unfortunately, he's no longer among the living. But uh, he said that he was inspired to write the story uh, when he was returning from a golf game and a trucker got right on his tail, started increasing speed and just crowding him on the road. And the guy, he eventually had to run off the road to get away from this dude. And he recalled that this incident took place on the 22nd of November, 1963. I imagine he had no trouble recalling the date because that very same day another prominent American was attacked while riding in his car. Interesting connection. Hmm. One of the first times the story was published was in an issue of Playboy magazine. Here it was discovered by the female secretary of a young up-and-coming director by the name of Steven Spielberg. Apparently his secretary enjoyed reading Playboy for the stories. Uh-huh. So, she brought the magazine to her boss and said, hey, you gotta read this story, and he did, and probably perused the rest of the magazine, and a little quiet time, and then he decided, yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to direct this movie. And it came out in November of 71 as an ABC Movie of the Week, a very popular series at the time. And I guess Universal saw the potential of not only this young director, but also of the movie itself, and decided, hey, we gotta re-release this for theaters. One small snag, it wasn't long enough. So, a couple of years after the original shoot, they got back together with Dennis Weaver and shot 16 minutes of additional footage to bring it up to a 90 minute runtime. Now, these extra scenes included the point of view shot of the car leaving the driveway and making its way through the city, David Mann's conversation with his wife over the phone, the school bus scene, and the railroad crossing scene. Uh, excuse I. This, of course, necessitated building a new truck, because the original truck was destroyed in the cliff dive during the original shoot. Uh, most sources say that two trucks were built, uh, with only one of them ending up being used. And uh, after they had filmed the filler scenes, this truck, or one of them, uh, would later appear in a, a Universal-produced uh, TV show, The Incredible Hulk. It appeared in an episode of this show uh, called Never Give a Trucker an Even Break. And it, uh, in this episode, it chased uh, the pro protagonist who was driving a Valiant, a Red Valiant, and they also uh, appropriated a lot of scenes from the movie and put them into this episode. Uh, Spielberg was not happy about this, uh, but it wasn't his movie, it was Universal's movie, so they could do what they want with it. Now, this truck, or one of them, still exists to this day and is maintained in roadworthy condition by its caretaker. And uh, you can find it all over the internet, you can find videos of it right here on YouTube, and... Uh, I, I have heard rumors that on occasion it has made its way down the old highway where the movie was filmed. God, what a trip that would be if you happen to be tooling along and spotted that sucker in your rearview mirror. My God. <laughs> now, there are a lot of people who wonder, uh, and I've even been asked this by, by a few of you guys, uh, is it possible that there are any remains of the original truck still in existence? Uh... I doubt it. I doubt it very much. If, okay, um, if any of these parts still existed and somebody who had them had a way of proving their authenticity, we would know. We would have seen pictures, probably would have come up for sale on eBay or some junk. Uh, there's also a persistent rumor that all that stuff is still at the bottom of the cliff. It was left there after filming. Uh, it's just inaccessible because, you know, uh, private property. 
I don't think so. No. Private property laws have never stopped people from taking pictures and souvenirs. There is, however, one small thing that it's probably nothing, but I think it's kind of cool. Uh, if you look at the final scenes of the truck in the movie, uh, the tractor is obviously pretty badly mangled after the cliff dive, but the trailer uh, is, is pretty much completely intact. Which brings me to this mysterious photograph. I have no idea of the date or location where this was taken. But, uh, you know, I've taken a real close look at this image, and there are some differences in the details. Sure makes you think, though, doesn't it? <laughs> this brings me to another mystery that I've been chasing ever since the 90s when I first saw Duel. Um, early in the movie, as David Mann is driving along, he is listening to uh, some talk shows on the car radio. In particular, he listens to a conversation between a man and the U.S. Census Bureau. The man has called them complaining about off-putting questions on the public census. Because apparently he is the man of the house, but he does not consider himself head of the household because his wife wears the pants in the family. Now, I believe that this call was specifically recorded for the movie because, uh, well... It is hinting at David Mann's character. It is something he can certainly relate to. And interestingly enough, there is an entry on the Internet Movie Database page for Duel in the trivia section crediting this phone call to radio personality Dick Whittington. As a matter of fact, Mr. Whittington does appear in the credits to Duel as radio announcer. Um, but... I can tell you, I'm 100% sure that's not him on that call. I have found some old recordings of Mr. Whittington's show, and I do believe you hear his voice a couple of times on the car radio. Uh, but that's not him calling the U.S. Census Bureau. It sounds nothing like him, and instead it sounds very much like another voice that I know very well from my childhood. You would be forgiven if you don't recognize this gentleman on sight, but if you heard him speak, you might recognize the distinctive voice of William Daniels, better known to my generation as the voice of Kit from Knight Rider. I'm going to play you a couple of clips here. I want you to listen very carefully. That is not a fire hydrant, you flea-ridden furball. Scoot. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to yell, but you left me no alternative. Actually, I rather like dogs when they behave. Well, it's true. It is a, well, I lost the position as head of the family. You see, what I do, I stay home. I hate working. I hate going out and seeing people and getting involved in the rat race and things like that. So she works, and I do the housework and take care of the babies and, and things like that. And so I was wondering, you wanted honest answers. Now, what well... Tell me what you think, but I'm 100% sure that is Mr. Daniels. I can't prove it, however, because William Daniels does not appear in the credits for Duel, but it's worth noting he never once appeared in the credits for Knight Rider either by his own request, because I guess he's a guy who keeps a low profile. But, uh, yeah, tell me what you think, and uh, if the Knight Rider historians are tuning in, uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think. By the way, great channel, love your stuff. Next up, we have a fan conspiracy theory. And don't panic, because I'm not going to try telling you that uh, getting the vaccination causes bad gas mileage or makes you artistic or whatever the freak. No, no, no. Uh, this is a fan theory regarding events in the movie, which I find intriguing. Uh, now, it concerns a major plot point. Towards the end of the movie where David Mann is attempting to outrun the truck, his car starts to overheat and crap out at the worst possible time, and there's a brilliant montage of scenes of the truck gaining on him, the car crapping out, and Dennis Weaver just, just, acting, just acting like a boss, just screaming at the thing to stay running as logs roll out of his pant legs. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a brilliant piece of cinema. And... But the thing is, it's uh, the whole thing with the car crapping out can be put down to a faulty radiator hose that he was warned about early in the movie. Uh, now, the, the casual viewer 
might say, damn, you should have listened to that dude, man. Like, wow, what were you thinking? Uh, others might say, I don't know, something's fishy about that. Somebody's barfed in the rose bush because it don't smell right. And so let's take a close look at that. Going back to the scene where he stops for gas, and one thing that he does uh, a couple of times in the movie is he always pulls up on the wrong side of the gas pumps. Did you ever notice that? It's kind of weird. But uh, the guy asks if he wants him to check under the hood, and the fellow pops the hood, and he says... Looks like you could use a new radiator hose. Yeah, where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that before? Yeah, well... As we know, David Mann is a, is a bit of a wuss, he's a pushover, but he's not stupid. We all know there are unscrupulous mechanics out there who will try to ding you for extra repairs that you don't need. And, you know, that's what's going through his head, as well as the fact that he's probably considering um, that this Valiant he's driving is basically a new car with 5,000 miles on it. Faulty radiator hose? It's not impossible, but highly dubious. He says no, you know, I'll get one later. And he goes off to make his phone call, at which point, well, let's, uh, for the sake of the theory, let's uh, just hypothesize that this fella was running a scam. So maybe he's feeling a little spiteful that he didn't, you know, get a few bu extra bucks out of the guy. So when Dave goes to make his call, the attendant has all the time in the world to whip out the pocket knife and cut a sneaky little notch into the hose. You know, it's not going to pop right away, but when it does, maybe the guy will come back for a new hose and an I told you so. And there is some evidence to support the idea that the attendant is a practitioner of douchebaggery, you know, squirting gas on the car, shortchanging Dave when he breaks a bill, then he rudely interrupts the phone conversation to demand payment for the gas. Class act, buddy. Later on, he stops at the snake arama once again on the wrong side of the pumps, and he asks the lady there, Do you mind checking those radiator hoses? I'll do that! Moments later, the truck starts tearing up the place, and as she raises her hands to shield her face, what is that she's holding? A radiator hose she was about to sell him, probably because she saw the Valiant's hose was getting ready to pop, or might even have been leaking already. Unfortunately, she never gets to install it, because he has to flee again. Dear me. <laughs> well, later on, of course, he decides to outrun the truck, puts his foot on the floor and goes charging up the grade, putting all kinds of load on the engine, heating it up, increasing the pressure in the cooling system until the wounded radiator hose can't take it anymore and kablooey! Houston, we have a problem. So there you have it. That is the dual fan conspiracy theory. Uh, David Mann almost died that day because of an asshole gas station attendant. Make of it what you will. It is only a theory, an idea. But I find it very interesting and even plausible. Well, last but not least, I'd like to talk about the finale of the movie. Uh, of course, the cliff dive. Now, I've had a few videos where I've spoken about cliff dives in other movies, which were obviously influenced by Duel, but I've never really, I've never really said much about the actual scene in the movie. And it's worth a look, because there are some strange things going on here. Um, <clears throat> right before the cliff dive, for example, there's a bit of a blooper where Dave bails out of the car, and the damage to the front end is momentarily gone. Uh, thanks to uh, YouTube buddy GamingNerds101 for pointing that out to me. I have no idea how you caught that, dude, but uh, yeah, that's a good one. And... Uh, so when the cliff dive ensues, uh, there are two very strange uh, anomalies in the picture. There's the open door on the truck, of course, which uh, for years has had people speculating as to whether or not the driver might have escaped unseen, something Rusty Nail would get really good at many years later. Uh, in fact, I remember watching uh, the movie with a, a buddy, and he was disappointed at the end when... Dave's doing his little victory dance on the edge of the cliff. He thought the guy was going to come up and just shove him over the edge, which, well, if I made a parody of Duel, I would totally have that in there. Um, yeah, so there's the open door on the truck, and then there's the, uh, the continuity error with the Valiant. A moment ago, it was on fire, but intact as it was being pushed towards the drop, and then as they go over the edge, it's suddenly a burned-out shell. 
Now there are two possible explanations here. Uh, neither of them can really be confirmed in any way. Uh, the first one is a story I read on an old movie trivia website years ago. This website seems to have disappeared. I have not heard this from any other source, so it's sketchy at best. But they said the car was positioned on the edge of the drop, set on fire, they were supposed to ghost ride the truck into it so they both went down. Well, when they went to shoot it, the truck did not have enough momentum, it pushed the car over but did not follow it, ended up stalling on the edge of the drop. So they had to winch the burned out car back up the hill and go again, and this time Carrie Lofton had to stay in the truck longer to make sure it was going fast enough to take both of them over the edge, and that is why the door is open, because he bailed at the last second. The only part of that that can be confirmed is the fact that, yes, the door is open because Carrie Lofton bailed at the last second. Um, the rest of that story, I don't know, but it does kind of go along with what you see in the movie. Now, the, the only other possibility that I can come up with, I have based on this one photograph that was taken while they were filming the truck pushing the car towards the edge. Uh, if you look closely, you can see a fireman standing off to the side, a single guy with a single hose, who, I guess it was his job to put out the fire in between takes. I heard from a, fire, a firefighter buddy of mine that car fires can be just as difficult to put out as house fires, because cars are just full of so many combustible materials, not to mention gas, oil, hydraulic fluid, all that stuff. Once they get going, they can be a real bitch to put out. So, maybe one guy with one hose wasn't enough, the fire got away from them, they had to let it burn itself out before they could continue. Could be, you know, could be, but that's speculation. And until I get uh, Spielberg's email address, that's pretty much all I've got. <laughs> well, I guess that uh, that does it for, uh, for this video, and uh, well, it feels great to finally get this one made. Uh, well, I guess I haven't really made it yet. I still got some editing to do, but hey, it's all for you guys. You're a great audience. Stay amazing, and until next time, cheers. They're a making hook at all the road stops that I can't be that fast. But I'm a truck driving food from the old school, and I ain't never been past.